three books that you can finish in a weekend. We're going to convince you to read each and every single one of these in your weekend coming up. Welcome, welcome everyone to a Tudor Realm podcast episode. My name is Richard. My name is Austin. Today, we're talking about three books that you can finish in a weekend. Now, reminder, you can finish one of these books in a weekend. We're giving you three options. It's not all three in one weekend. It could be. They're all you three could. super... They're novellas. You these could, are if you're dedicated. These are 100-page books, and they're all sci-fi. They, they are basically short sci-fi 200-ish. books. 200-ish. It's fine. Yeah, they are short <laughs> sci-fi books that you could finish that we've finished in a day. It takes yes. what the reading times anywhere from four hours to eight hours, something like that. But confirmed, I have finished all of these books in one day of reading. So I think we're ready to start off. But with- what's the very first recommendation we got here? We've read all three of these books. We have a rating for all three of these books, and we're going to convince you to read each and every single one of these in your weekend coming up. Yeah. So first one is All Systems Read by Martha Wells. Oh boy. This was a great book that we read due to our Patreon. So we have our monthly book club and our patrons picked this one for us to read. I think this was February of it, last year. This was year. our very first book club we've ever done when we started our Patreon back Oh in the day. yeah, you're this right. This was for the OGs. <laughs> the OGs there. <laughs> because we only had half a month because we started our we started our book club halfway through the month and we needed a short that. book to read. Yeah. And this is a, it was a perfect short sci-fi to read. And did we pick this ourselves or do we have people vote on it? I think people voted. I don't know. I think I think mm. I feel we may like have just Curtis. Picked it. I feel like Curtis did it. Curtis does a lot. Curtis, he's been here for a while. Yeah. <laughs> I think he did this for us. <laughs> All right. So give a quick synopsis about what the book is, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about it. So book is in your fairly standard sci-fi uh world. Big corporations control a lot of the different groups and nefarious reasons. We have our main character, Murderbot, who very recently has hacked his governor, its governor module, but got to be careful there, its governor module to basically take autonomy and is no longer controlled by the company and has free will. What does our self-identified Murderbot do? downloads TV shows and movies so uh, it can watch them instead of actually doing their job and it's so leaving. fun <laughs> it is a socially awkward murder robot oh, that yeah. has gained sentience and I can I fill in the first sentence of the entire book I think is a great synopsis of what you can get into and expect for this great it, so I could have been a mass murderer after I hacked my governor module, but then I realized I could access the combined feed of entertainment channels carried on the company's satellites. It had been over 35,000 hours or so since then, with still not much murdering, but probably, I don't know, a little under 35,000 hours of movies, serials, books, plays, and music consumed. As a heartless killing machine, I was a terrible failure. <laughs> it sets the perfect tone for this book that it is a funny sci-fi that if you're looking for a super quick read that I would say is a must read just for the fact that there's almost nothing like it in the genre. There's no con to it. That's that's a nice thing of being able to recommend a much shorter book is the less time it takes, the lower a bar it is. Like it for how short it is and how enjoyable of a time it, it that you get out of it. Yeah. It's a hundred percent a must read. Just how quick it is and how fun and unique angle and perspective on a robot gaining sentence. How many times did you smile throughout the book? What was your smile count meter? Oh, the entire time. (laughs) It it was only slightly less than my Terry Pratchett smile meter. Yeah, Terry Pratchett smile meter is through the roof. Through the roof (laughs) the entire time. This was like 85% of the time smile meter, which is high. That's That's a a high high one. Because you know how when you talk when you read something alone yeah it, you're just neutral face mm-hmm. when someone says like oh i laughed they actually exhaled through their nose mm-hmm. all the time normally you don't smile when by yourself reading something i smiled quite a bit while reading this and chuckled out loud several times uh, how do you have the numbers for how long the book is audio version and all that what yeah. can you tell us that so on 
Uh, it is a three hour and 17 minute audiobook on Libro.fm. You can check the link in the description below if you want that. Not on Audible, Libro. They, are, also, they don't sponsor us. Also, but, you know. all three of these books will have an affiliate link in the description below to Amazon if you'd like to buy them. <laughs> we're going to have to find something else. Well, we're like going to have to find an alternative to Amazon, but for now, it's on Amazon. You can check them out That's there. That's where people buy books. Anyway, that is a 44,000 roughly uh, word count, mm -hmm. and that's about 176 pages. And those are the pages when you, do we have Murderbot nearby? Where, whoa, where's our Murderbot? Here it is. There Murder we go. Bot. <laughs> the pages themselves are tiny and big print. So the, again, you can see it takes, a, it's a three hour audiobook. It's, it's a three short. hour audiobook, meaning you can finish this in what? Roughly an hour and a half? Two hours? Slow, yeah. maybe two hours. Patrick Leo, who had a review on Goodreads, says it took him an hour and a half. Yeah. That's Something it. Something like that. It's the, the length of a very short movie. Yeah. And, for that reason, it's incredibly worth it. Talking about the series as a whole, yeah. currently there are seven books out in the series. Now, this book can be read on its own, but of the seven books, the first four are novellas, and they each one is its own story, but they complete an entire arc. And so those four can kind of be read together as seen as a total package. And then after that, book five on there are continue different stories and a different arc. So would you agree? There are which? actually two full length novels in this series as well. And the latter ones, like book seven is that or book I believe six or book like five and book seven okay, are full two. length novels. So there's a lot of variety with this. Well, would you agree with me though? Because I read books one and two, you've read the first three. I read the first four actually. First four. So you Sorry. can do you put up three? I put up three. I copied you. Four. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had a, a... Yeah, when we did this in the book club, I think I did a seven-month hiatus, then read the next book. It's not anything <laughs> where if you're daunted about, oh, I don't want to start another series, you don't have to. Yeah. You could read the first one and stop. You could read the second one and stop. There's never a... A thread that's just going, oh, I have to go to the next one. It's not going to consume your TBR. That's well, a that's a safe bet. Would you agree? I mean, yeah, it's not structured to be bingeable. In I mean, very enjoyable series, but it has a pretty good conclusion. But it's not leaving you on a gigantic cliffhanger that like I gotta read the next book. I think it's a good sci-fi palate cleanser. It's oh, a definitely. good. You could always do this, and you go your your epic fantasies and your sci-fi, and you come back and do a little Martha Wells. Murderbot. And yeah. by the way, Martha Wells was an anthropologist, or it has in a has a bachelor's in anthropology. And the the Makes reason sense. that's a bit important because this whole book is it's deeper than just fun. It's fun and smile, but there's the layer of what makes us human. And she has something to say about how this murder robot is more human than Richard. In many ways, yes. In, in all the ways. <laughs> Murderbot is more my friend than you are to me, is the is the weird thing. She yeah. she makes this robot so alive. I would say the the biggest comparison to this book, I don't have another book, but I have a movie. Okay. Wally. -E. A funny version of Wally. -E. Wally -E is the is the most human robot ever. But now imagine that in a more adult with adult more adult themes in a book. That makes you smile rather than go, oh, Wally's a goaded movie, by the way. Wally is top tier. Top tier Pixar film. Top tier. No, top tier film, Richard. Film. True. Good. Good. <laughs> True. But <laughs> I, I forgot our rankings. <laughs> <laughs> but do you have any uh, any comparison book other than, I, I think Wally's the one thing that popped to mind. I don't know another book that would be a good measure to compare to. I, the thing is, what what I am reminded of is its difference. So oh, yeah. there's plenty of sci-fi shows like thinking I think immediately to Star Trek, uh Next Generation and uh Lieutenant Data. So, uh Commander, sorry, Commander Data. Oh, that's me shit. I don't know what you're talking about. It's fine. I I will explain. Okay, explain. A lot of sci-fi shows do talk about the robot that wants to be human or how yeah. close they are yeah, to yeah, being yeah. human. Right. And often it's done in Can I say highbrow? More, hmm? Highbrow, is that a right way? More it, like the focus is on the severity of it where this is more levity or is that wrong? No. That's okay. A little different. Uh they have a lot of different ones, but often it's the robot doesn't have emotions and is learning to have emotions. Like oh, okay. A human. Got it. That's 
standard, basically. Mm-hmm. That, that's your typical robot wants to connect to human story. This one is a robot that is trying to connect to humans. But they do have emotions. Their Murderbot is just incredibly awkward for very valid reasons. It's not just, oh, they're awkward. No, they're awkward because of their sense of... They're, they're different. They have different. He has it has different <laughs> senses. Like l- literally, can see how you fall in the trap. Like he, she. It, I know. It, it, even as questioning, you're thinking it as a human as you're talking about this. It's, it's crazy. It's great. But the big the big point is because Murderbot has a variable sense of time, can control how it perceives time, control what it's viewing from can control its memories on what it chooses to listen to, what it chooses to delete out of its memories, how it processes pain. All of these different functions leads it to a very different living existence, which means it has a hard time connecting with people. That's very different of not having emotions. It's just Murderbot's emotions don't sync up with what humans do. Yeah, I don't know if we've emphasized that enough. And even more so, it's not... A robot that wants to be human, Murderbot specifically doesn't. He it finds humans gross and squishy and weird. Doesn't want to be human. It, imagine doesn't your like it. your lone wolf character that's a human being that social having social anxiety. Yeah, it's social anxiety in robot form, and that's what also makes it relatable. Of oh, we can all relate to being the awkward the awkward years. Mm-hmm. We're still in our awkward years. Yeah, you, you never get out of your awkward years. The awkward years are here to stay the, forever. If, it's not a phase. If anymore. you're a fantasy sci-fi reader like us, you're always in your awkward years, and yeah. this is a perfect protagonist to kind of vicariously live through. Like oh, I feel exactly like that, and the robot. What's cool? And if it, if you haven't noticed, this is all spoiler free. Like we're just keeping surface level stuff. We're trying to get you guys to read the book. We're not going to go into spoilers for this, but with Murderbot and all the situations Murderbot goes in and having the technological capability to actually delete conversations or view things from different angles, they they have technology that can propel their social anxiety where a yeah. human has to kind of face things and has no way out of the conversation, whereas a robot has some th- tricks up their sleeve. Oh, yeah. No, Murderbot doesn't want to think about something or engage in a conversation can Shut quite up. literally just eh, turn off that functioning of brain and just go into a different thinking mode or delete the conversation as it's going like there's so many weird coping tricks that the robot can do yeah and it's really fun to see a robot that has difficulty dealing with humans but also doesn't want to be human that's what i see all the time with different sci-fi is Robots that want to be human, like our arrogance that humans are, and I think that's actually a quote from the book, but like the arrogance of humans thinking robots w- will want to be like humans, mm. where Murderbot's like, why the hell would I want to do that? It's that gross and awful. Yucky. It's yucky. gross and yucky. Mm. It's weird. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you give your, did you rate the book overall? Do you have an overall star for this out of five? My official Rambler rating for this book is a 4.25 out of 10. Out of a 5. Out of 5. I keep thinking. <laughs> I'm sorry. I get confused, everyone. You know, 4.25 out of 5. Yes, 4.25 out of 5. I gave it a 4 star out of 5. I think it's a great book and high recommend for its so short for what you get out of it. If you don't want to listen to us, this has won the Hugo Award for Best Novella, the Locus Award for Best Novella, the Nebula Award for Best Novella, and an author you don't love. Patrick Ruffus. We have to admit he is Look, a master. He's, he's a master at his craft. I just don't like his plots or his characters. But you also might like his opinion on this book. Maybe. He says, I'm painfully aware of the fact that most of my reviews end up being, well, not reviews. Usually what I do on here is tell stories about how I feel about books or I muse about the nature of storytelling or I maunder on about some element of the book I read and use it as a stepping off point to discuss characterization or tension or something like that. So let me do something that I rarely do in these reviews. I'm going to make a simple declarative statement. This is one of the best stories I've read in years. Hmm. That feels abrupt. Normally, I talk in circles around an issue. I'll illustrate my point long before I ever actually state it. Sometimes I never come out and actually state it at all. Let's try another. I've never felt an emotional connection to a protagonist of a book like this before. I've never felt an empathetic connection to a character as strong as this before ever. Seriously, guys, I cannot recommend this enough. It was fun. 
and funny. It made me laugh and it broke my heart. It is smart and quick and well-written. It's unique in its concepts and excellent in its execution. Try it, try it, try it. For God's sake, just try it. Trust me and try it. You know what? A broken clock is right twice a day. (laughs) <laughs> you agree with that review? Yeah, no, I agree. It's it's pretty great. So Patrick Ruffles can't be right sometimes. But then our boy Patrick Leo gave it three stars. But ignore that. He's usually right. Patrick Leo's the man. He's a great booktuber, but he didn't get he wasn't on the ball with that one. It's okay though. He gets this one. He gets one pass. One singular pass. <laughs> one singular pass. I'm on I'm on to you, Patrick. Before we go on to the next book that we recommend, what do you think? out of our rating system what are the best categories of this book and what were the worst what do you think it highlights and the lowlights I think the best characters is the thought provokingness because I still think about it now on nature of what is what is it to be human and how we interact with our own reality and people around us and characters so characters and thought provokingness were the best categories yeah so if you're looking for that type of that type of focus those are the books you're looking for Definitely a high recommendation. I agree with you. And I would say even highlight on the characters and maybe emotion too, because that smile you're going to feel, it's a smile. So let's go on to the next book. Our second recommendation for all of you is a very personal lover of mine. I love this book. It is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. I am sorry I don't have a physical copy. We actually had an audio book of this copy. I bought it on... Did I buy it on Libra? I probably bought it on Audible. I think this was before I switched. But we read this book together for the first time while driving up to, like, we're doing some road trip up north. And so we listened to It was west, but same thing. Was it west? It was west, yeah. I thought it was It was that timeshare scam in Sasko, whatever it was called. Was it? It was. we went up north. Oh, okay. No, it was that when we went to that place. They gave us, like, a free night. Turns out we had to go to the timeshare thing. We basically... We lost a lot of money. No, we didn't spend anything. <laughs> we, we lost a lot of time. Time. We, it was a lot, we well, saw those cool caves out there. That was that's cool. That's true. We got yeah. to see that. Yeah. The but book, though. The we book. We listened to the book on the entirety of the trip, making it a one-day read. We're going to count it. Um, the audiobook is five hours and 51 minutes on Libro.fm. Not audible. Also, the affiliate link in the description below for Hitchhikers to Amazon. <laughs> We're, we're such hypocrites. It's just, which one? We do what we choose. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're half committing to our uh, principles. Now, there's a 46,333 uh, word count and roughly a 208-page uh, page count of this book. This was a one-day read for us. I think we did it in two different... Was it one audiobook session we did it one in? One audiobook session. And all the way up. I can't highlight enough. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you've probably you've definitely heard of it. Uh, when, before Rich and I went to go read this i think our only reason for reading it was oh how have we not read it yet yeah it was one of those of eh, and this was inevitable yes this it seems to be that it's on so many people's top 10 lists of best books of all time people's favorites especially a lot of different scientists really love this book just for all the different references that it makes and how smart and witty it is so we felt we had to read it and we're going to carry that on Definitely. It, <laughs> Definitely a need. Rather than with All Systems Red being that character that you can live vicariously to and just really connect to the character and then laugh out loud, Hedgehiker's Guide to the Galaxy is one of my favorite books ever because it... I tears cried laughing. Tears cried laughing, bawling my eyes out because it got me that good where it, the book is an absurdist nothing nothing matters or makes too much sense it's absurd it's an absurd world most similar to Discworld and fantasy if you've read Discworld before that's the best comparison you can make because the author douglas adams is a british author and yep. they have that fantastic british humor that douglas adam actually wrote uh, some episodes for doctor who back in the day he wrote for monty a monty python skit he had, so you could imagine the category hitchhikers in and if you have not given it the read yet it it frustrated me a little bit at first because I didn't get what the book was going for. I expected one thing and I was just, it was kind of meandering. I was like, all right, this is fun and funny and all. And I was smiling every now and then, but the end of the book and the philosophical message, if you don't know what it is in Hitchhikers, it's a must read because it will, it, I still think of it to this day. There's, it changed the way I think about the world, this stupid book, <laughs> this stupid, absurd book. And it has the characters 
are meaningless in the sense, do not do this if you're a character reader. Characters don't matter. The prose is hilarious. It will leave you with a message, and it is so worth a read. Uh, little details on this book series as well. That uh, Did you know that it originally was a... Uh, 1978 BBC radio comedy first. Yes. So there's a yeah. radio comedy series. I think there's now actually six books in total or roughly six comedy uh, segments of it, um, of which weird details of it. Of Hitchhiker's Guide is a trilogy. However, there are six books in an increasingly inaccurate trilogy. <laughs> 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 so basically, it was planned as a trilogy, and when they got to the fourth book, to go, eh, fourth book in the trilogy, <laughs> it just kept going. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. It's just the weird British stuff. <laughs> that that's their that's their humor. I finally learned to learn for four books it was a tetralogy. Tetralogy. That's what they call it nowadays. Yeah, I don't like that. Nah, so just say trilogy plus one. Trilogy, trilogy plus two. Trilogy plus one. I like yeah. how they do it here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a radio show in 78, and then I, I think the po- book published in 79, a year after, which is a four or f- five years because I think the first Discworld book came out in 1983, if I'm not mistaken. And so right around that time, you just, British humor was in its peak. You had Discworld, you had Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And that was a good time to be alive as a Brit. Oh, yeah. As a human. It still is pretty good now. I'm glad the Brits are alive today. Well, the good thing is good. now now we have all the books are already released and we can just digest them all. That's right. We don't need them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the, I think we... I hone on this enough, but if anybody's read Discworld, you haven't read Hitchhikers. It, yeah, if you like Discworld, you're going to love It's the sci-fi version of Discworld, and Discworld's the fantasy version of Hitchhikers. They, will, they have their differences and lots of differences, but the same say, kind I of think feeling... It's, actually more absurd than Discworld. Yeah, fair enough. In in a weird way, it's more ridiculous, more absurd, and more nonsensical. Of, like, just absolutely incoherent. But it still somehow works. You know what the difference might be, too? Because the Discworld books, uh, each book that I've read so far goes for a message about humanity and something uh, emotion or something philosophical. Uh, and not to say that Hitchhikers do- doesn't, but Discworld goes for a focused thing on the human level, whereas Discworld pulls you out to the wide scope of the universe, and it's going, who cares about these individual human stories? I'm going to give you a perspective about the universe. So Discworld's always kind of focused. Mm-hmm. Hitchhikers is just, no, we're, H- Hitchhikers is a zoom out, Discworld is a zoom in. Well, it's definitely a a more positive, uplifting take on nihilism and kind of the emptiness of the world and how you can kind of feel the universe is ambivalent to you and what good message you can take away from that. It, it's I found this out. So Adams, Douglas Adams describes himself as a not just atheist, but radical atheist. Yeah. At, just so he could distinguish himself from an agnostic. And he said, uh, he said, oh, what's that? Oh, oh, I didn't I, interrupt I, you. Oh, no. I, I was just used to it. <laughs> <laughs> no. So he said he uh, he had a quote here where he was saying he remained fascinated by religion because of its effects on human affairs. He and he said, "quote I love to keep poking and prodding at it. I've thought about it so much over the years that the, that that fascination is bound to spill over into my writing." So his fascination with religion folk spilled into his writing. And I want to say this with, "Hey, if you're religious or atheist, I, I will say this." My two favorite films are Lord of the Rings and Everything of at Once. The one is completely about God not existing, and one is about its themes with Catholicism and not purposefully and not allegorically pointed at that like Narnia is and C.S. Lewis, but they are such opposites in that regard. If you go in this with... I, I don't think this preaches at you is what I'm trying to get at. It is another perspective, and what stories can do is just give you another human's perspective about the world, and yeah, it can be a huge nugget that even if you don't agree with what Douglas Adams says, and I'm not saying I do or don't, it's just sure. he presents something that sits and makes you think and goes, wow, I I, I cannot emphasize enough. Like If you just, just let it pull you through, and the entire book... The entire book has a point to it, even with its absurdity. I think it's definitely important to know if you are religious and you believe in a higher power, this book kind of, from the get-go, sets out a premise that you will disagree with. However, if you put yourself in 
in the shoes of an atheist and how they view the world, this is definitely a more positive outlook to it. Because often, if a life with an ambivalent universe that doesn't, that has no plan for you, people often slip into nihilism. And hey, if nothing matters, who cares about anything? Why do we do? Why do we even get up in the morning? Mm -hmm. This is a great answer on for who are who, people who are looking for their purpose in life, and what does that even mean to even look for your purpose? Should you be doing that? And in an ambivalent universe, is there such thing as a purpose or one singular one? All of these ideas, I, everyone, in, even if you are religious, have come across those questions, mainly asking, what is God's plan for me? I think this is a, from that perspective at least, you, you'll you gain something out of this book. Yeah, it, it is. the I just mentioned everything, everything everywhere at once that references hitchhikers in the film. Mm -hmm. And it... It is just like Lord of the Rings and fantasy has influenced other epic fantasies and the whole fantasy genre. Hitchhikers kind of has that staple. Like Hitchhikers, Neuromancer, Dune. Those big books have their respective influences on their niche. So even if even if you wouldn't don't agree with the message, you don't like the new thought it gives you, you didn't find it super funny, it's historically also good to read. Oh yeah. No, it is the it's one of the staples if you're going to read an absurdist, uh, an absur absurdist mock mockery book. Yeah, if you like like Monty Python's, it, it's mocking, but in a good way to fantasy yeah. or to like castles and medieval it's, medieval times. I should say it's absurdist comedy, and yeah. it's so influential to other books that even try most don't even hold a candle to it. It's a very hard genre to actually do correctly and for how large it is i didn't mention last time but also this has a 4.15 on goodreads okay. while well, this has a 4.23 a little bit higher and a little bit high. little higher. matt i i've been shouting out uh book reviewers with each mm -hmm. of these last one was patrick who gave it a three well gave three to all systems read matt's fantasy books gave it a 3.5 and he says in quotes was fun and silly but ultimately felt like felt like a poor man's discworld <laughs> 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 which Terry Pratchett in Discworld is so genius. I understand where he's coming from, but I love both. <laughs> I do too. Yeah. I think I like Discworld a little bit more. Fair but enough. What did you rate this one out of five stars for Hitchhikers? Here's the thing. I still give it a 4.5. 4.5 out of five. Mm -hmm. I remember right. I, so I think it's a spectacular book. Excellent. Mainly the what it does well, it does so expertly it, it, it does what it does well expertly so the other maybe short uh, shortcomings of the book are not as important yeah i i completely overlook any shortcomings i give this a five stars floored me i this i love this book this will be on my staples of you I would love to, if anybody ever reads this book i will talk about it with them <laughs> this will it, the thought provokingness for me is one of the highest categories. The emotional impact, one of the highest categories, because emotionally just hilarious. Uh, can I give a quote or two? Go ahead. Uh, so this is one of my favorite quotes from a book ever. The ships hung in the sky much in the same way that bricks don't. <laughs> it's the anti-joke of anti-jokes. And here's You do uh, love your anti-jokes. I love a good anti-joke. <laughs> and here's another short one. Obviously, I'm just giving the shortest quotes possible to be quick with it. Here's another one. For a moment, nothing happened. Then... After a second or so, nothing continued to happen. <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it, it's just absurd and being ridiculous anti-jokes. It's that fun humor that I just love. And that's just a little snippet of the pro style you get from Douglas Adams. Uh, would you agree that thought-provokingness and emotion are the higher ones here? Oh, it's uh, for me, it's um, the thought-provokingness. I gave it a 3.75. Uh, uh, sorry, Jesus. 4.75. I was going to say. I can't ooh. read for crap. And then I gave prose a 4.5. I think it's just prose expertly, well. expertly. expertly written mm -hmm. for me. I gave both those categories a 5, so I'm just I'm yeah. floored by this. On, I love it. You're on cloud I love nine. it. I love it. And I think even even with our love for this, I the third do you want to go into the third book that we have re recommended for everybody? Yeah, third one, little the one blurred out on the thumbnail yep. to rope you into watching the whole video. <laughs> <laughs> what is the third one, Rich? Third one is Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer. This one was also a book club book. 
that was. was very mixed in our community. It was mixed. But between us... We, we thought it was great. It. We, we love this book. Our patrons are wrong. <laughs> they are. They're objectively wrong, and we recommend this. And not it's just, a must read. Not just the patrons. This is a 3.77 on Goodreads. Yeah, that's insane. And this this book, Annihilation, uh, and the reason I was, uh, the reason we're so excited about this is, would you say this is maybe, may, it's up there, maybe top five for the most unique book we've read? Up there for, in It's definitely in, in my top ten. Of unique, uh, unique angle books, and we'll get into some of the details of that. But just to start off with its length, of I did so, I actually did read this entire book in one day, mm -hmm. literally the day of book club. I woke up early and I read it before book club started. So it is one day finishable. <laughs> <laughs> it is six hours on Libro.fm. Um, then there's a 58,305 word count with 195 pages, depending on the copy that you get. Mine is, yeah, 195. Exactly. Isn't that a crazy thing? This is one-seventh of a Sanderson novel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of just goes to show, in, in most of the cases, yeah. when people ask, hey, are books too long? Um... I'm mostly agreeing. Like, I think you can get most of the stuff you want to get done in a book in a much shorter format. You can do you can do a lot in 200 pages. You can, but Epic Fantasy gives you another itch it that you can't get. It gives you something else. This. The more yes. time you develop, the more love. I just and... know I've read some books that are 500, 600 pages. That, I'm going like, that, yeah, this could have been 200. <laughs> oh, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> the the premise of this book, Rich. Uh, yeah. Well, do you want to give the premise of the book and why? Sure. It's so interesting. <laughs> interesting is, I think, the key word here. Yeah. So the premise of the book is planet Earth, our Earth, not too much different other than suddenly, for no rhyme or reason, an area zone kind of populates on the planet that things start acting weird it's called Area X, and it's growing. It's expanding. When people go in, they don't often come out. And when they do, often their memories are messed up, wiped completely, and almost always kill themselves. So, government is putting together a task force. They've sent groups in before. We are following a person that is not even named, just the biologist. We're following her story on going onto this expedition team, going into Area X, and we discover more about the area, the group sending sending these missions in, the biologist herself and others. Why is she going into this hostile, almost certainly deadly area? Right. So we just it's just a big mystery horror novel. And we Tons slowly find out more of the reasons of why our main character protagonist went there. And you have, it's this protagonist that is an unreliable narrator yeah, in a that, lot of the ways. That, I think, is the best aspect of this book, where I think if you're reading this book and you're taking the narrator at complete face value, you will be, you'll be missing something. I, I think it's important to note that for the most part, I think the narrator or main character's statement of events is true. However, her thoughts on the matter and her internal dialogue is not accurate because it's written in the style of a diary log. So she is literally writing down this story. I don't believe she knows or at least is not honest enough to write down in this journal what her true thoughts are. But you can interpret it through her actions and how how she how, says it, how she says it yeah. and things that she says, oh, I don't care about this. And then she mentions it several times. So it's like, clearly you do care. You're mentioning it many times for someone who doesn't care. It's in such an interesting book. And it's the the tone or the setting of the book is eerie yeah did you just feel eeriness and this not the not the not a horror like it not not a you, you know not a yeah. movie it's or not something a like that where it's not a horror. jump scare horror it is a eerie 
uncomfortable feeling and if you're it's it's a unique setting that i've never been in before where you just have this creepy lingering uh spookiness yeah it mainly it's just a horror tension that is constantly taunt it really doesn't let up which in many i don't know about you but it's kind of exhausting like reading the book of just basically you just see the hammer and you're just waiting for it to drop the entire time and it doesn't let up yeah very different experience yeah. and especially more enjoyable for me was by the end of the book feeling like i knew the main character more than she knew herself and Pete, that's fun that's a really fun way to read a book and Oh, I, I will. Know, I do want to talk just briefly yeah, on go. some of this stuff. Of the series itself is called the Southern Reach trilogy. Mm. It's an actual trilogy, not a uh, six books that. Not a hitchhiker. It's not thing. hitchhiker. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. an actual trilogy. <laughs> it was also a. It was turned into a film in 2018 by uh, director Alex uh, Garland. I've not seen the movie. Comment down below if you'd be interested in us doing a book to movie uh, comparison review. Yeah. Let us know what you think, and we could probably watch that movie. I'd be interested in doing it myself. But going on to the actual book and what you think about it, mm -hmm. what, is, what is your official Rambler rating? The official Austin Rambler rating. Yes. It, it's not fair because you get the triple R. Richard Rambler oh, yeah. rating sounds The Richard so Rambler better. rating. It's the, the RRR. Mm, dang, the ARR. Sounds almost like a mm, dang. Like R, like pirate. I don't like it. Yeah. But the R rating, <laughs> the ARR rating for this book is a 4.25 out of 5 stars. It's a really great book. Fantastic. I gave it a 4.0 out of 5. I think it's a great book. Okay, so on your ranking, you would go Hitchhikers, All Systems, Red, Annihilation. Yep. But and I would go Hitchhikers, Annihilation, All Systems, Red. Yeah, it's... The thing is, these are very close, and they are all very different genres, so oh, I totally. pick them up for different reasons. Oh, 100%. And I think the reason this has a lower Goodreads score, and it was more controversial with our stupid patrons, who thank you for your support. We, we honestly love it. So our the, the more controversial opinions come from this book is very niched. Like that cosmic horror, the kind of eeriness you feel. I'll say this. Patrick Ruffus also gave a review for this, and it's two short paragraphs, and then I'll go off this. He okay. says... Really good books, very different, very atmospheric, and different than anything else I've ever read. I read part of this, and really, I'll keep it there. I'll, I'll stop his quote there, where exactly what he said, it's atmospheric and different than anything he's ever read. Because, Rich, you and I, of all these books behind us that I've read two of, all these books, right? <laughs> it's so weird and different that if it can be strange when a, when a film or when a book is going for something that isn't, doesn't follow a typical trope, or doesn't follow a typical story pattern or beat can be can get neg can get negative reception just because people expect something else or this doesn't have the character arc or like a it's not a chosen one it's not a name typical tropes I, out there I do know one book that yeah. it is kind of similar in structure which not one? tone or anything else but in structure oh, tell me yeah which one Piranesi oh my rich I'm so stupid. I look. I, I it's on my notes. It's on. Look, I have it right there. You do have I, it. Right I, there. I literally had similar books. Pure Nessie. <laughs> I'm so stupid. I should have. I should have beat you to it. Oh, well. I, now you get the credit. It's not I fair. get the credit, it, not you. It's exactly what. Actually, I, what? you just typed that in. You didn't have it. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> but it does have that. Yes, yeah. that Pure Nessie eeriness. Oh yeah. Well, it, well, if you haven't read Pure Nessie, also good book. Um, <laughs> Rich, I, I I understand. It's a fantastic book. You gotta read it. Perfect book. He means it's a perfect. Perfect. Anyways, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so but the structure is very similar. In you're being told through a journal entry slash letters or diary. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I see what you mean. And Especially, and also unreliable narrator. And also the atmospheric setting being one of the main focuses of getting you immersed in the world. Just a, a, and them being short novellas. So, yeah, so it has I, a lot of patterns, though. I would definitely expect so expect the atmospheric center of the book. Expect a non-reliable pro, a non-reliable narrator, and don't go into it looking for a shock, gory horror. 
that's not what this is going to be. It's not your big action set piece. It's not going to, like, there's not one singular monster that is, you know, jumps out and scares you and you have to save the day from it. It's not that. It's just a weird atmospheric book that you slowly grow to learn more about your main character. Well, yeah, and it's elevated by the fact that our main character is a scientist, a biologist. Mm -hmm. So the way it's written to you is almost like a science report, but also really creative and in a way that's digestible. So it's yeah. she she writes scientifically. So, uh, here, here's one quote from the book of, uh, the uh, some questions will ruin you if you are denied the answer long enough. Uh, just to kind of go her, her scientific prowl you're just trying to solve things she's going to area x in the first place she's curious but then we find out there's other motivations too so it's mm -hmm. deeper than just her scientific thinking but she'll constantly write to you and it will seem both sciencey but also digestible it's it's i love the pro i love so much about this book yeah it's a I, really great book i actually gave the pros a three uh 4.25 and i thought it was fantastic yeah same thing with the the thought provokingness i give it a 4.5 yep I thought it was spectacular. I, I think I just flipped those. I think I gave four two five to Top of Volcanoes, four or five to Pro, something like that, but excellent on both regards. This again, even character is great for this. I what would you say it doesn't do well? Um I would say the two things that it does it does these things well, but less in comparison would probably be plot. I think the plot is good and Gives you some interesting nuggets along the way through, but as a plot structure itself, maybe not amazing, spectacular. I think that's my lowest category too. I think I gave it a four. Still great plot. I think like, not the with, emphasis. Like yeah. characters, I think the main character is fantastic, mm -hmm. but the side characters are good to fine. But depending on how much you want to judge, like, are you judging the book a lot on its side characters or are you just focus on the main character? I give it such high in characters because I think only she the matters. Main yeah. I mean, it's about her. If it's but, just that, then I probably would give it a 4.5. Yeah. If it's just, Excellent. if I'm just judging her, it's a very high category. Now, mind you, of the three books that are recommended, this is probably the hardest to like because of it being niched down. So in the reading order, I think a good reading order for this would be Try All Systems Red, then Hitchhikers, then Annihilation. You could finish the, these all in one weekend. Did you the see? Main, the best part about this is it's a niche, weird book to recommend. But yeah. because it's so short, I'm confident to ask people to give it a try. Oh, absolutely. Like we, We're not kidding when we say must read. You must read this because yep. you need a new perspective on books. We are tasking you. Yeah, now it. you have to do it. You so listen to us all the way through. Come back to this video and give your Rambler rating for all three of these books after you've read them over your weekend. Mm. Uh, you have a week. We're, we'll be waiting. No, they have a day, a weekend. Well, for one of them. Okay, they get three days. They get three days. Three days to read Three these. days. We will be back here three days from now. We're checking those comments. Let us know. And also, if you guys like video styles like this where we're trying to get more... Uh, Spoiler, more, more spoiler free videos. Book pitches for spoiler free books. Yeah, book pitches. We're trying a new video style. Uh, we enjoy this because we kind of get to talk about books we don't can't do full length videos on, mm -hmm. and we like we haven't talked about Annihilation yet, and we love yeah. to talk about it because maybe we'll do a full full review eventually. But it, it allows us to talk about several books in one, so we like the format. But let us know if you kind of want more videos like this, yeah. and we can go from there. All right, we're gonna have our three fantasy book recommendations coming soon. That's coming next, Actually, or not next. Soon. Very soon. Sometime. But three fantasy novellas that are a must read. But Rich, did you enjoy yourself today? I had a better than average time. Great. We'll take that. We'll see you all next time. Bye, y'all. <laughs>